Today's guest is a lawyer for health and wellness professionals, and her name is Sharon Vannon. I am really excited for you to hear my conversation with Sharon because if you're like most of the coaches in my community, you have got a lot of concerns and questions about all the legal issues surrounding your business. And in today's episode, you are going to get answers to many of those questions. Now, Sharon is the founder of a niche law practice called Thrive Legal Care and its sister legal template shop, the TLC Source. Sharon's own story is fascinating. She actually worked in the world of corporate healthcare law and policy for 14 years before deciding to change paths and become a nutritionist. However, along the way, she realized that there was an unmet need for legal support in the health and wellness world. So now she leverages her legal and her nutrition backgrounds to provide an insider's perspective to help health and wellness businesses set themselves up for success. So I think that you are going to love this conversation. Let's dive in. Well, hey, Sharon, welcome to the show. Hi, Kim. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I am so looking forward to this conversation because I know that my audience has just a ton of questions about the legal aspects of their business. Um, you know, all of those legal, ethical things just create so much anxiety. So I'm sure that you see that too, Sharon. So I'm really excited for this opportunity to learn from you and and really, um, you know, hear your tips and strategies and all of those things. But before we get into everything, I would just love for you to tell us a little bit more about you and the work that you do in the world, Sharon. Thanks. I am a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 15 years and I've always worked in the healthcare system. And that was up until about 2019 when I decided I was going to take a different direction in my life. And right at the start of 2020, I went to nutrition school and it was kind of a nice, um, it's just a nice continuation. I have a background in health science and I had been working in the healthcare system for many years And I was really craving a way to connect with people more one-on-one. And so nutrition to me felt like the perfect bridge and uh, went to school thinking I was going to completely leave law behind. And then while I was in school, my classmates, my colleagues found out that I was a lawyer and they started asking me questions because they had some anxieties about starting their business and they just weren't sure where to go. And I started answering questions and I realized there's actually a market here and that the wellness world is not well served with legal services, especially for Canadians. So one thing led to another and turns out that I decided okay, alongside my nutrition practice, I think I'm going to open a law practice because there's there's something here and there's a lot of interest. So that's what I do. I run a law practice. It's called Thrive Legal Care. And I'm also launching any day now. Stay tuned. There will be a template shop to accompany that. So I've got all the templates that health coaches, nutritionists, anyone in the wellness world can use to support them in their business. Oh, that is so amazing. And I mean, you're a hundred percent right. I'm sure you saw that immediately that there's just, there's a huge need and, um, and it's such an underserved, I mean, there's just so many questions, so much confusion. So it's amazing that you have been able to bridge those two things that you are, you know, interested and passionate in. So very, very cool. Okay. So, um, let's get into today's topic. Let's start by talking about why wellness business owners, why do they need to be aware of the legal side of doing business online? Can you break that down for us? Absolutely. So what a lot of people don't realize that when you're running a business online, it's still subject to laws because some people think, you know, you're kind of on the on the, the fringes of the traditional business world, which is not the case when it comes to law. So you always have to practice by the same rules. And in, in some cases, there are different rules that apply if you're online. So first and foremost, you want to be aware of these things because there's a lot at stake for you. You have invested money in your education, in building your website, in getting all of those parts coming together to have your business be a viable 
vehicle for you. This is your livelihood. So you want to protect all of your investment. Like there's, you've just come too far to risk it. And the other thing is that you have to think about who's on the other side of your business. We are in the people business and we're all doing this kind of work because we really care about people's health and well being. And we want to do work that's in service of that. And so if you have some cracks in your legal foundation or you, you're blindsided about some of those things, you may not be able to show up in the way that your clients need you to, whether that's you know inadvertent. People, I, I believe, truly want to do the best. But sometimes you may be overstepping certain legal boundaries like scope of practice, or you may... Um, have just issues that come up in business, like somebody wants a refund, or you're making claims, and somebody has a misunderstanding about what they can expect from you. So lots of things, lots of moving parts. And when you take care of all the legal stuff, especially at the beginning, it gives you such peace of mind, it lets you move forward, it lets you focus on the work that you really want to do and bring your best self to your clients and just have have greater impact doing what you love. Yeah, I think that that's just so important, that peace of mind piece that you just mentioned, because I think it can be such a distraction for people is they if they if you feel like there's kind of these gaps and these spaces, things that you really haven't attended to, um, and you're maybe at risk, you're exposed, like all of those kinds of things can be just such a distraction, can keep you awake at night. And it's like totally independent of the actual work that you're here to do um, and will yeah. slow you down and, and hold you back from the actual work that you're here to do. So yes, I, I totally agree. So peace of mind is, is a really important thing, obviously. I would love to talk about content creation. So I think that many people are, you know, at least aware that they need agreements and waivers and you know those kinds of structures in place when they're working with their clients but what about the content that they're putting out there like what legal issues do wellness business owners need to be aware of when it comes to content creation mm -hmm. and this is so important because content creation is such a huge part of what you're doing in your business, whether it's blog posts or Instagram posts or reels, or you're creating digital products, your courses, all of these things, this is all your original creation, or it should be, you should always be creating your own work unless you have explicit permission from someone else to use it. So the, all of this, this is your body of intellectual property and intellectual property is recognized as something that is protected by law, whether you're in Canada or the US, I know you have an international audience, but there's two sides to the intellectual property coin. So I like to call it respecting and then protecting. So respecting is about not infringing anybody else's intellectual property. Like I just said, don't use anything, whether it's a photo or an article that you don't have explicit permission from the creator to use because that's copyright infringement or it could be trademark infringement as well. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you are on the right side of the usability of those uh, that intellectual property. And then the other side of the coin is protecting. So that's where your intellectual property rights come into play. So if you have created, let's say it's an ebook or a proprietary course, and you've put your blood, sweat, and tears into that, you can protect that legally. And in most cases, you should because you don't want somebody else to swipe that from you to copy from you so that they can then profit off of your hard work. That would that would be terrible. And something to keep in mind, because so many health coaches are online, it's very easy to infringe other people's work. So I just really want to caution people, be proactive about it and make sure you've got the right protection for your stuff. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I do hear a lot of people being quite concerned about when, you know, when, because it does take a lot of effort and time and energy to put, to create content, to create things of your own, and then you're putting it out there in good faith. Um, and the concern, of course, is that it's just going to get uh, swiped by people who don't, you know, obey that first piece of that, that you just gave the respect part. Um so what do we need to do though to like actually protect? You know, we've we've created something, a course or an ebook or even free content. Like how do we protect that stuff? Mm -hmm. So the simplest and easiest thing that you should always be doing if it's a course or an ebook, something where there's like some actual substance to it, you always want to put a uh, copyright notice 
on that. And you should, it should always be conspicuous because you want this to catch people's attention. So that, you know, you've seen the C in the mm. circle and the year and your, your name. So that's the simplest way. You don't actually have to formally register your copyright in Canada or the US. You can simply mm -hmm. put that on. And in fact, you actually don't even have to put that on. It's just that puts people on notice, but you automatically get copyright protection just by virtue of creating something. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing, if you want to formally register it with the copyright office, you can, it's a small fee. And beyond that, it comes down to how you are presenting that material. So if it's something that you're selling through your website, you want to make sure you have really clear terms of use for the purchaser so that they know that when they are buying something from you, they are only allowed to use it for their non-commercial use. You're not allowing people to buy this so that they can then turn around and sell it. So all of that, you want to make sure that's captured in a really well-drafted terms of use agreement and that is usually the way that you can uh, build in a level of safety for those kinds of products. Mm. So with the terms of use, so I hear you say that like the copyright, you're automatically protected. Anything that you create is automatically protected by copyright. You don't have to, like, let's say you forget to put the little C in the circle <laughs> notation at the bottom or whatever. It's okay. You're still protected. Um, but with the terms of use, like something that you are selling, is that something that somebody has to actually sign and send back to you? Or is it enough for you just to have it be like a document that comes bundled with the thing that they're purchasing with the product or the course or, you know, whatever it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Because most people nowadays, they're going to be selling things online. And a lot of times this will be done through an automated process, and you actually don't interact with your purchaser, they're just pressing click. And mm -hmm. so what you want to do is whatever platform you're using to sell your, your intellectual property, that platform should have a place for you to have a click and then you can link your terms of use there. That's how it's done in digital commerce. And, um, you know, most of us, we've many times in our life, we have clicked agree, because <laughs> that's just how it works. So that is actually a legally binding contract. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not as ideal because you don't get any negotiation and you don't get a chance to explain the terms to the purchaser. But we've all come to accept this as part of the way we do business mm -hmm. online. So that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. That is so good to know. Okay. Now, in terms of marketing, like I feel like there are probably some legal issues that people should be aware of when it just comes to their marketing. So could you give us some insight into what are some of the things that wellness business owners should be aware of with their marketing? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple, there's a few categories. One, and I'll just kind of like give you the, the categories and I'll explain a little bit. One is how you are presenting yourself. The other one is presenting what you do. Another one is presenting your marketing relationships. And then the final category is how you're presenting your testimonials about your clients. So the first one is how you're presenting you. You always want to be honest and transparent and presenting yourself with the highest integrity because that is so important in building no like, and trust with your audience. And the way you can do that is um, just being really open about who you are, what your, what your name is. I've actually seen some businesses where people are not using their full name. Always use your full name because that is just a, a non-starter for building trust with somebody. Um, being honest about your training and what your title is and what your scope is. So then that we're going to move on to how to talk about what, what you do. So something that's really important to keep in mind, especially in health and wellness for coaches who are, you know, they're trying to show the impact and they're trying to show results, you want to be really careful that you're never promising, you're never guaranteeing that you can achieve any kind of result for anyone because that's not possible. It doesn't matter how awesome you are. It's just not a guarantee. So you want to be very cautious in showcasing the impact that you can have in someone's life without going too far because that's misleading and that's not very honest. So it always comes back to that. Always be honest, always be in integrity. And then another thing is that you shouldn't be saying that you can do things that are outside of your scope. Um, there is a limit to what a health coach can do. So you want, always want to be careful that you're, that you're staying within your lane. And the third category is um, how you talk about your marketing relationships. And so this is where 
you may have an affiliate relationship with another business or you yourself might be an affiliate. And what a lot of people don't know is that affiliate relationships are, they're governed by law in Canada and the US. And those laws are taken pretty seriously and they come with some very hefty fines. So you definitely don't want to be infringing those laws. And they are not, um, those laws aren't onerous. They're actually based on just common sense things that are about protecting consumers from uh, misleading claims, from dishonesty. So again, it's just so important. You always want to put your best foot forward. And that means be honest, be in integrity. Um, you're always trying to build trust with your audience. And, and we work with people. So always keep in mind, how would you want your business to be received by your audience. So those are the first three. And then the final three is how you are presenting testimonials. So testimonials are amazing. It's such a great way to have social proof for your effectiveness as a business. And people use testimonials. Most consumers want to see them. So by all means, use testimonials, but you have to be honest. It's actually against the law to use false or misleading testimonials. And so what does that mean? That means you have to use testimonials by real clients who have actually paid for your services. You cannot coerce someone to provide a testimonial for you. You can't fluff them up. They, they have to be sincere and they have to be honest. And um, you should also make a disclaimer that your testimonials the results may not be typical. And this is really important if you are doing anything in the realm of like weight loss, where you might be using before and afters. It's just really just be cautious that you're not again, trying to over promise that you're, it's just a, an example, you're just providing some social proof, but you're not guaranteeing that the results can be that be the same for everybody. Yeah. So when it comes to th with those testimonials, like how so you're displaying, you know, your clients amazing results and, and people want to hear about that. You want to share that information, all of those things. But when it comes to you have to somewhere it needs to say results are not typical or something along those lines. I mean, I've seen that kind of language in various places. I'm sure we all have. Is it enough to have that like in the footer or something like where, what sort of guideline, if you, if we're talking, because most often like on, if we're talking about an online business, it's on a sales page, right? That you would be showcasing, um, you know, your previous client's results. So where, where are you sticking that on the page? Like just for really practical suggestions. Yeah. And, and I mean, our, web, like your website is supposed to be a vehicle to sell, what you're offering, right? And you want to balance mm -hmm. that with the need to be honest and transparent. So what I advise people to do is to put that in your website terms of use. And I always recommend that if you do have a website for your business, okay. you have to have terms of use because that is, those are your house rules for your website. And that's where you can include a, a you know, a, a clearly worded disclaimer that yes, you use testimonials, but they are examples only. And that takes some of that liability off of you as the business owner from suggesting that those results will be possible for everyone. So you can do that there. If you are very cautious and very risk averse, you may also want to put a statement on a sales page. I don't think that's necessary, but some people might want to go that extra step. That's, that's up to you. Yeah. Yes. I mean, everybody has a different risk tolerance, right? So it's kind of like whatever, you know, if you want to take those extra steps because it makes you feel more comfortable, protected and helps you sleep at night, then that's fine. But you're saying that really, as long as you've got that as a clause in your terms of use for your website, then that, that covers that concept. You've covered your bases there. Mm -hmm, right. And also, even before you post your testimonials, I highly recommend that people have a good system in place for making sure that they're getting clear consent. Like you should, in Canada, it's against the law to use a testimonial mm. without someone's consent. It's not against the law in the US, but I still recommend that you do it. It's just, it's best practice, right? You don't want to like catch someone off guard and they see that their, you know, their testimonial is online and they didn't approve it. So I recommend that as well. You just always want to have good communication and it goes back to this is a way of how you, this is a way to preserve and promote good relationships with people. So get their consent before you post anything. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's good practice. Absolutely. I want to circle back to something that you said earlier. One of those first tips that you'd said things about um with your marketing is how you're presenting who you are. And also it kind of connects with the the question of 
or the issue of like your scope of practice, because this comes up all the time for me. I hear this all the time is if you are a regulated healthcare professional. So if you are like a, a, a um, <clears throat> you know, like me, I'm, a, you know, an MD turned coach, but there's many other people who are also similarly in some kind of regulated healthcare profession, registered dietitians, psychotherapists, you know, all of that. But this is you presenting and marketing yourself as um, a health coach or a health and wellness coach. Where's that line? And how can you present that clearly? Because, and I hear so much frustration from fellow physicians who are like, I have an MD, I have all of this training but I'm not supposed to use it because that it's going to get misconstrued. The relationship gets, um, you know, I'm not supposed to be presenting myself as a doctor, but I, I'm, I'm supposed to hide the fact that I have an MD. So can you just speak to that a little bit about, that? because I just get this question coming up a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky area. And uh, for the most part, all of the regulated professions across Canada, they have very clear guidelines and regulations, actually. So they have the weight of law behind them on what you can and cannot say. And some professions, it depends on what province you're from and what profession, they're quite explicit about exactly the terms you can use, exactly where on your website you can say this and what you know, a lot of it's very detailed. So if you are practice, if you're actively practicing, and you have uh, active membership in a registry, like registration with a, a regulated profession, you have to, uh, you have to abide by that, because it's the law, it's the regulation for your profession, and you don't want to run afoul of that. It gets a bit blurry for those regulated professionals who are operating a business where they might be a health coach and they're not necessarily doing it under the umbrella as a dietitian or as an MD, but yes, you have earned those credentials and no one can take them away from you. They are part of your title. And so then it becomes, how do you present yourself in a way that's ethical, that's transparent, that's not misleading the public and is not running afoul of your regulatory requirements if you are maintaining active registration. There's too many variables for me to say one way or the other without knowing an exact case in front of me. But I would say to somebody, if you have any qualms about what is required of your regulatory body, have a conversation with them and say, this is what I'd like to do. What do you think about it? So some, you know, some people feel comfortable having that conversation with their regulator and others don't. But I would say if you really want to be on the as on the side of certainty, knowing that you are not overstepping your professional regulatory obligations, get consult with your regular with your regulator. Yeah, that's that's good practice because I mean you, like you said, they they are quite robust in terms of their like whatever regulatory body we're talking about in terms of their uh, requirements and their guidelines and their boundaries and so. Um, if you can't immediately find that information, then consulting them directly is a brilliant idea. I mean, of course, that makes perfect sense. And then, of course, getting legal advice too, because um, I know that all of these, it's a case by case thing, right? Um, because so <laughs> there's just so many nuances. It really is. All right. Okay. Did we get through all of those like different categories? Or I feel like, did we, did we hit them all? I think so. Yeah. So there was how you present yourself, how you present what you do, how you present your marketing relationships, and then your testimonials. So if there's anything else that uh, sort of any unanswered questions, happy to happy to field those. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious if you have encountered like any any like common myths and misconceptions that people have, like when you've worked with health and wellness professionals and coaches and you know whatever designation what are some of the things that people kind of get hung up on that we could kind of break down that those myths right now? Mm, okay. So something that um, I see often, and it, it's almost across the board, it doesn't matter what type of business you're in, but I think a lot of people understand that you should have a disclaimer on your website. And a disclaimer is simply a statement saying, this is who I am. This is what I'm qualified to do. This is what I can't do for you. And what people generally understand is that you should be disclaiming that you're not providing medical advice. But what most people are not mm -hmm. adding to that disclaimer is that you're not providing even the advice 
that you your business provides. So I'm a nutritionist. My disclaimer says I don't provide nutrition advice in addition to not providing medical advice because when somebody visits my website, they could be anybody from anywhere in the world and they're not a direct client of mine. So I don't have a relationship and I want to make it really clear to any random person who's on my website that I can't have a one-to-one relationship with you unless you're my client. So that's a missing piece. And it's, it's really simple to do just making sure your disclaimer disclaims you're not providing medical advice and you're not providing health coach advice or nutrition advice, dietitian, whatever, it, whatever your skill set is, you're not providing that through your website. That is such a good point um, because yes, you're right. Like, of course, there's all kind of like there. That is the thing that most people disclaim is like, I'm not replacing your doctor. I'm not providing medical advice. But yeah, you're right. Like, if you if you have a website as a coach, you're also not coaching them. Like, if they are just visiting their their site, uh, your site. So that's important language, I would think, to have in your uh, website disclaimer. Yeah. And even if you are an MD, you should also be disclaiming that you're not providing medical advice for the same reason, because the people who are visiting your website, they're not your patients. Right. Exactly. Um, You know, I'm curious, like what sort of like with your creating, um, you know, more involved content, like I know that a lot of people that I work with, they have plans or have created, you know, written books, like bigger, longer form content. Um, Even if you are, you know, an MD, I've worked with some MDs who have written books. um, And is it is it a similar kind of approach to when you're putting out website content where you're just you're it's a one directional thing you're putting out content to the world with no connection or personal relationship with whoever it is that's consuming it so is it it, tell me about like any safety issues around that or like legal things that you need to consider when you are you know putting out information that's sort of long form like detailed advice and you know those kinds of things Mm mm-hmm Yes, that's a really good question. You should also be including a disclaimer in those types of products because, again, they could be getting into the hands of anyone and you want to be really clear that you're providing advice, you're providing information, education, you're not providing one-to-one care. So um, that's always a good practice, having a disclaimer anytime anytime you're spreading information, whether it's your website or some other format. Yeah, that's 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 good to know for sure. I mean, there's a lot of different things to talk about. I would be curious to know when do you I mean, th- this is kind of a loaded question, but when is, when does it make sense for people to actually reach out and connect with a uh, with a lawyer, with an attorney to to get more like customized and individual ad- individualized advice? You know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about are things that people can, you know, do for themselves to a certain degree, but how do you know when you actually need to get a lawyer on your team? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is an area where a lot of people um I think this is like this is actually going back to your question about myths. There seems to be a myth that um there's like a certain threshold that you have to pass in order to qualify to or when it makes sense to get legal advice and really it doesn't matter if you are it's your first day in practice or it's you're a month away from retirement. The law always applies. There is no grace period for being new in business, unfortunately. Mm. So uh, day one, the, the sooner you can do it, the better. And you're just um, that much more prepared. You're setting yourself up for success and you're, uh, you're just building that solid foundation so you can go out there, do your thing and not have to worry about it. Um, and, and, and so with that said, you don't have to take all of the steps all at once. And if you do get one-on-one legal advice, a, a, you know, a good lawyer will advise you on, you know, they'll, they'll sort of say like, these are the areas where you've got higher risk. And here are some things where you can maybe just kind of put that on the back burner. Like it doesn't have to be all at once. You can do it in baby steps, but there's always something, you know, there's always some legal issue that will be in place no matter what stage you're at. So the sooner the better. Yeah, that is such solid advice because it's it's so interesting how you phrased that is like that there's no grace period. The law does not say, oh, it's okay. You know, you've only been in practice and business for a short time. So the law doesn't necess- doesn't really apply to you. Of course it applies. So, so you're absolutely right. 
This has been so amazing, Sharon. You have shared so much value. Um, you know, I know that people are going to really feel a lot more comfortable. Like it's just so, it's just such a scary, uncomfortable thing to really not even know what you don't know yet. So it's just such a good thing to be able to to bring that guidance and information. I would love to know, you know, where can people go to to connect with you and learn more about your work and all of those things. Oh, thank you. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm at legal TLC and my law practice website is at thrivelegalcare.com. And there's a link to the template shop, but the template shop has its own website and it's the TLC source.com. And that's coming very soon. So stay tuned. I love it. Okay. I will put all of those in the show notes too, for sure. Now, before I let you go though, I would just love to ask you one last question. So if you were going to share, you know, one key takeaway from our conversation or maybe just the very first step that our audience should do right now, what would that be? Hmm. Well, definitely be proactive about protecting your business, but don't be daunted. I, my goal is I want people to feel empowered. I don't want people to feel afraid or that they have to be so cautious that it holds them back. You are doing work that you love and you, you know, you're serving a purpose and people need you. So go out there and uh, just with, you know, a little bit of protection at the right time, you will be set up for success. I love that. That is just the perfect balancing note to end on. You know, be informed, be proactive, but don't be daunted. Don't let it stop you um, because there's solutions. So I love it. Thank you so much, Sharon. Oh, thank you, Kim. It's my pleasure. Yeah, it was a great conversation. All right. Well, I hope that you got a ton of value out of that. I hope that Sharon helped to clear up a lot of the confusion and the worry that legal issues can cause when building your business and growing your presence and showing up online and all of those things. I would love to know your thoughts. Has the legal part of your business caused you anxiety? What are the biggest things that you worry about? Let me know in the comments if you're watching this on video or if you're listening on the podcast, then go ahead and find me on Instagram and let me know. Okay, that is a wrap for today. As always, I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Have an amazing week and I will see you again very soon. 